Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing today about rethinking, reduce, reuse, and recycle policies and programs to address waste. I'm Dan Bursett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. This is the second online briefing of the week. And considering that it's only Tuesday, that is a pretty fast start to a very important week in climate policy. If you missed our session yesterday, which focused on climate adaptation and resilience, and was co-sponsored by the 2021 UN Climate Change Conference, the British Embassy Washington, and the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, you can view an archive of the webcast by visiting us online at www.eesi.org. And that goes for all of our work. Everything is available online for free. And the best way to keep up with our work is to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Today, we bring together panelists who will help us understand the climate impacts of all the waste we produce. The average American generates about one ton of waste per year, which is the highest per capita rate in the world. Of this 300 million tons of municipal solid waste, about half of it ends up in landfills, which accounts for about one-sixth of human-caused domestic methane emissions. And remember that methane is an even more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. For years, many of us have felt a little better about our garbage because we are very good at recycling. But recycling is not always economic, and a good deal of what we toss in the blue bin, especially plastics, and especially single-use plastics like bags and baggies just ends up in big piles somewhere and does little to cut down on petroleum consumption. In the opinions of many experts, despite what many of us think, recycling is an increasingly non-viable alternative to reducing our waste. And so in just a moment, our five panelists will describe the problems of waste. And because this is an EESI briefing, teach us about new and creative solutions to reduce, and reuse, and sometimes recycle our waste to minimize its underappreciated contribution to negative climate impacts. But before our panelists begin, let me mention that we would be glad to take your questions as we go to help our, inform our discussion today. After our fifth panelist, we'll have a Q&A. And if you have a question that you would like to incorporate into our discussion, we have two ways for you to ask it. You can send us a message at, or an email rather, at EESI to EESI at EESI.org, lots of EESIs. Uh, or you can also follow us on Twitter, at EESI Online. And now it is my privilege to introduce the first of our five speakers today. David Alloway has worked at the intersection of waste, materials, and the environment for over 30 years. He currently works as a senior policy analyst at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, where he recently co-chaired Oregon's Recycling Steering Committee. David has also uh, recently served as an advisor to Project Drawdown, in the New York Times bestseller, Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. David, welcome to the briefing today. I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Thank you so much. Just bringing my slides up here. Can you tell me if you can see my slides, please? Uh, yes, looking good. Okay, great. There we go. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I am David Alloway with the state of Oregon, and I've been asked to provide some context and history to frame today's panel. I'm going to cover three topics today. Uh, first, the environmental impacts of materials and waste. Second, a quick look at how the United States ended up with our current approach to recycling. And finally, a major effort underway in Oregon to modernize our state's recycling system and policy framework. So let's start out by asking about waste. Waste or garbage is an environmental phenomena that generates strong visceral responses on the part of the general public and policymakers. Garbage is perhaps the most visible, daily, obvious manifestation of our impacts on the environment. We interact with it every day. And in some ways that's regrettable because it leads to some misplaced priorities. In this country today, garbage is not particularly impactful Emissions from waste landfills and incinerators contribute about two and a half percent of our nation's domestic greenhouse gas emissions. That's not insignificant, but it's not huge. And we can contrast these disposal-related impacts 
with the impacts of making the materials that end up as waste. Those impacts are easily 10 to 15 times higher. Many of the materials that become waste here in the United States are produced in other countries. So in order to understand our, the climate impact of these materials, our domestic greenhouse gas inventory is of limited utility. In contrast, a consumption-based accounting framework tells a more complete story. Oregon's consumption-based greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which estimates the global emissions resulting from consumption by Oregonians, shows that emissions over the life cycle of materials contribute 41% of our state's carbon footprint, more than the emissions from direct consumption of electricity or fuels. And if we zoom in on these materials-related emissions, we find that only 1% are the result of disposal. The remaining 99% are a result of raw material extraction and manufacturing, and to a lesser degree, freight transportation. So this country's waste disposal problem, while real, pales in comparison to the challenges of unsustainable production and consumption. And the materials that become waste are at the center of that challenge. Now, recycling can reduce the impacts of those materials by a necessary, although modest amount. Most of the benefits of recycling occur when collected materials displace virgin resources upstream in the production process. Reduced emissions from landfills and incinerators are a much smaller benefit from a climate perspective. Recycling can also conserve energy and reduce other forms of pollution. But to be of benefit, recycling needs to be done well, and our current recycling system is delivering some mixed results, especially as we continue to export contaminated recyclables to countries that lack adequate infrastructure, such as these plastics, which weren't properly removed by processing facilities in the US, and they were shipped out in bales of paper and sold to a paper mill in East Java, which then dumped them in the countryside. This is not the consequence of recycling that anyone wants to see. So recycling is necessary for a sustainable future, and it can be done well, but even if it's done well, it's insufficient by itself. Looking back at Oregon's consumption-based inventory, as a state, we currently recover around 40% of our solid waste. And if we could bump that up to 90% recovery, it would reduce climate impacts, but only by about 3%. So while recycling is necessary, it is also insufficient, and we need to activate some additional solutions. Those include waste prevention, reuse, clean production, material substitution, and sustainable consumption. These should be equal, if not higher priorities. Just as an example, this graph shows the relative environmental impacts of delivering drinking water in a single-use plastic bottle, with that bottle either disposed of in Oregon, in blue, or recycled in red. You can see that recycling the plastic bottle reduces impacts. That's a great thing. However, there is a far better option, and that's just to skip the bottled water and drink from the tap. Those impacts, including the dishwasher, are shown in, on this graph in green. And if you struggle to see them on this graph, it's because they are almost zero when compared to the impacts of using a single-use product and recycling it. We should reduce first and only then recycle. Now, as I just explained, most of the benefits of recycling are a consequence of collected secondary materials displacing virgin materials in manufacturing. The environmental benefit of recycling is all about that market, but policy in this country largely has it backwards. Most policy focuses on collection and emphasizes the importance of individual consumer behavior as opposed to producer responsibilities and roles. Indeed, if you go out and you ask your neighbor, do you recycle? They'll probably say, yeah, I recycle. But we as individuals are not recyclers. We are merely the beginning of a supply chain, a supply chain that collects materials to be recycled by industry. And this confusion is so pervasive and deeply rooted that most people aren't even aware of it. Now, the reasons for this are rooted in history. As this country urbanized, Cities were faced with a public health crisis, infectious diseases uh, spread by putrescible waste being dumped into streets. New York City responded by forming the Department of Sanitation, the first U.S. city to make waste collection a municipal responsibility, and other cities followed suit. 
Fast forward to Earth Day, 1970. Activists in places like Ann Arbor and Austin began operating drop-off centers for people to recycle. And 10 years later, they wanted to expand the reach of these popular services. Industry and the federal government weren't interested, but progressive city councils were. Recycling collection was added to the portfolio of these cities as a logical extension of their role in waste collection. And over time, more than 10,000 cities in this country joined the recycling crusade. And as a consequence, this country has an inconsistent, crazy quilt patchwork of collection programs that are all struggling against the headwinds of unfavorable economics. These collection programs all act as taxpayer or ratepayer subsidized supply chains to industrial users whose payments for those materials come nowhere close to covering the cost of collection and processing. In Oregon in 2018, ratepayers spent more than $200 million paying to collect and process recyclables, and that was net of the revenue provided by the end markets. Industry benefits from and promotes recycling, which conveniently places the responsibility on someone else, since recycling is viewed as the domain of individual behavior and responsibility. And it's no accident that we think this way. The twin drumbeats of recycling and individual responsibility keep the public and policymakers distracted from other issues and solutions like waste prevention or producer responsibility. And the PBS documentary, uh, Frontline Documentary Plastic Wars provides some evidence of this strategy. So I'll briefly mention what's happening with recycling in Oregon. As a state, we were highly dependent on Chinese end markets. And when China closed the door to those exports in 2017, our system really struggled. Collection programs dropped materials, increased costs to ratepayers or both. The state convened a recycling steering committee, which spent two and a half years studying the problems and alternatives. And we identified that on the surface, recycling is challenged by the following factors. The public is deeply confused about what and how to recycle, and this confusion leads to high levels of contamination, which in turn results in higher costs for the ratepayers who currently pay most of the costs of our system. There are inconsistent recycling opportunities across our state, and we have a race to the bottom among processing facilities that are largely unregulated and really struggle to sort out all the garbage people are sending them and unable to assure that all materials are being sorted and recycled responsibly. We're continuing to landfill materials that could be easily recycled, and that's a missed environmental opportunity. There are inequities in access to service, working conditions, and the distribution of burdens from pollution related to recycling. And there's a loss of public trust as we cannot ensure that materials are being recycled responsibly. So these are the problems we see on the surface, but many of them are the consequence of some deeper root challenges. The first is that environmental benefits and economic signals are not aligned. Recycling can reduce cost to society through reducing pollution and climate change, but these benefits are not reflected in the economic signals that industry and local governments are responding to, and this leads to an underinvestment in recycling. Second, Oregon's laws for recycling were not designed for today's challenges. They were designed 30 to 40 years ago when, when things were very different. Program economics were driven largely by newspaper recycling, which has largely evaporated. Plastics are much more ubiquitous today. 30 years ago, nobody anticipated that we would mix our recyclables together or that we need processing facilities to sort them out or that we'd export them to distant lands with less environmental regulation and infrastructure. And finally, there is a significant gap in the responsibility involving consumer brands. These producers have the unique power to influence changes in packaging and product design, create market demand for recycled materials, and reduce price volatility, but they are largely absent from our current policy framework. The Oregon Steering Committee researched options and debated for two years, but ultimately found consensus on a comprehensive proposal that addresses product labeling, consumer education, access to collection, processing facility standards and regulation, responsible exports, waste prevention, design for the environment, and social equity. It's a shared responsibility proposal that would continue the parts of our system that work well and improve the parts that don't. Ratepayers would continue to pay for the majority of system costs, while producers would pay for approximately one third of those costs. 
This proposal is the basis of a bill which is currently under consideration in our state legislature and which just passed out of its policy committee last week. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop here and we'll look forward to a robust discussion after we hear from the other presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for that excellent presentation. Um, you mentioned Plastic Wars, the frontline documentary, which you're featured in. Um, we also at ESI had an opportunity to speak with one of the producers of that documentary, Emma Schwartz, uh, and um, we released that interview as I think the latest episode of our podcast, The Climate Conversation. So if you would like, I definitely recommend watching the documentary. It's awesome. Uh, and I think it's probably freely available because it's PBS, but it's really good. Um, but if you'd also like to listen to the discussion we had with Emma, um, it was a really excellent conversation. I thought I learned so much. So thank you so much, David, for um, that excellent um, kickoff to our panel today. And now thank I get you, to Dan. introduce our second panelist, uh, Jennifer Wright. Jennifer is an environmental program supervisor with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources Land Quality Bureau. In this role, Jennifer leads a team of professionals within the financial and business assistance section who work with Iowa citizens, businesses, and communities to provide financial and technical assistance resulting in cost-effective improvements, opportunities for increased productivity, and positive environmental impacts. Working together with our stakeholders, we continue, or, uh, Jennifer and her team continually strives to achieve a cleaner environment and stronger economy through the sustainable use of natural resources and effective waste management and pollution prevention activities. Jennifer, welcome to the panel today. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Let me get my presentation. Can you all see that? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for having me here today. I'm actually here to speak about one of the programs that we administer in the financial and business assistance section, and it's called the Iowa Waste Exchange. It's a little bit of a misnomer because it's actually a materials exchange program, but um, the program was created in 1990 by our Iowa State Legislature. They wrote it into our Groundwater Protection Act and the funds that were provided for that. And so they, they established it as a waste exchange and we've just continued with that name. It's funded by a percentage of our landfill tipping fees and it's, that funding has primarily stayed the same over the years. Um, we've determined that we've been able to get about a 650% return on in that investment. And that's mostly because we provide $400,000 in funding to a regional council of government. In the code, we are not, um, DNR does not receive any funds. It's almost like a pass through to a council of government or possibly a community college for them to in essence be out in the field um, trying to find materials to match as well as doing really what I would like to consider a little bit of like light consulting services. Um, based on the fact that we provide them about an average of $400,000 per year and yet they are able to save, bring an annual savings back to Iowa around $3 million we were able to determine that they have about a 650% return on that investment. Let me go back. The program is free to business industry uh, predominantly, but also to citizens if they have a need for a material that they want or they want to match. It's confidential and it's non-regulatory. Uh, it began, became, began as a pilot at our Indian Hills Community College um, but it's since evolved to becoming a very comprehensive program with five um, area resource specialists. And at one point it was coordinated and managed by the state's Iowa Economic Development Authority. We have a sort of a cooperative agreement with them that they collaborate on this program with us. However, it is our program, it is part of our code chapters, and therefore we brought the administration back to the DNR in 2006. So some key statistics. Um, since the 30 years that um, it began, we've been able to divert, obviously, a little over 4 million tons of waste. 
um, an average that equates to about 135,000 tons each year. Uh, we've saved Iowans uh, almost $120 million, and we've been able to do that through diversion first and foremost. That's the primary um, calculation. And then the second is, which was 105 million, and then the second savings of about 14 to 15 million comes from all other work that we do for business and industry clients. Um, and that would be like a waste sort. Perhaps we assist them in writing a grant or a standard operating procedure or any waste management plans that are required. Uh, so we put a rate to that and then we um, equate that to the service so that we can show that benefit beyond diversion. They've served almost a little over 67,000 clients in the 30 years that we've been in existence. And our focus is on agricultural pursuits, business and industry, uh, schools, colleges, government, municipalities, institutions, including hospitals and clinics. We've also supported nonprofits and our private citizens, like I had mentioned in the previous slide. And as I kind of touched on in the last um, point about the diversion and the other savings, the services we provide are not just identifying marketable waste streams. We do waste sorts. Um, we will locate markets and value added byproducts. Uh, we'll, like I said, write grants, loans, SOPs, waste management plans. We also do a lot of presentations at conferences, workshops, and other speaking events. Um, we tend to author guest articles and always have special um, events like um, at various fairs across the state. This is just a map of our primary service areas. As mentioned in the first slide, we started with 10 boots on the ground and now we're down to really what is five broken out into five specific regions. Three of the service reps are full-time employees and two are half-time. In fact, one, two, and three primary service areas are my full-time service reps and four and five are um, half-time employees. And it looks a little odd and um, imbalanced. It seems like, wow, one has a, a lot of burden on their plate, but uh, it's broken out on industry and where we have the larger industry and larger population bases. And clearly in um, region one, it's not as predominant from uh, business and industry, it's more ag, and it happens to also be more um, collectively smaller population bases. So my last slide is just to kind of talk a little bit about some of the fun and interesting projects we do. Um, our reps never rule out any waste stream. In addition to industrial sludges and recyclables, such as the general paper, cardboard, plastics, um, we've matched everything from stuffed animals, as you can see up in the top where the little girl is holding her lamb chop stuffy, down to um, construction and demolition materials. Um, up on the far right, we have a program within Iowa DNR's financial and business assistance that's called the Derelict Building Grant Program where we go into rural communities of populations smaller than 5,000 and we assist them in deconstructing or renovating uh, blighted structures on their main streets so that they can either um, rebuild them and use them for a new purpose or if they deconstruct, they can divert the materials from the landfill and that's where the um, Iowa Waste Exchange area reps come into play. Uh, we also have done um, fun things like art installations. Down at the bottom, we have a picture where there's four gentlemen standing in front of a wall of what is perceived as circles, but it's actually two semi loads of some off spec washing machine windows that came um, out of our um, one of our whirlpool when they used to be here in Iowa. Um, and they actually are, they light up in different neon colors. And it's a really fun interior arts installation for one of our um, office buildings in downtown Des Moines. Um, in addition to some of those findings, like the manufacturing um, and businesses have old inventory that they didn't know they had. 
such as these unique um, Coke coolers, which we ended up distributing to small stores throughout the state. Um, the group works on a variety of projects. So in addition to providing matches, but as described on this slide, we also have assisted in addressing debris from a fire at a hog confinement facility. We assisted them in establishing an on-site composting pile for all those swine mortalities. We've assisted at special events, such as Project AWARE, which is a river cleanup initiative across the state every year, Coleman Race for the Cure Earth Day festivals, and um, as I had mentioned in a couple of slides back, also doing different fun events at the Iowa State Fair, but also assisting those county fairs and the main Iowa State Fair with uh, recycling and other um, initiatives. Like this year, we're working with Iowa State Fair on um, a big composting um, education project. So that's all I have. And in the interest of moving this along, I'll move it to the next speaker. If you need to get a hold of me, attached is my contact information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and um, you said that's all that I have. That was a lot. That was a really cool presentation about a really innovative program that's making a positive impact for residents of your state. So thank you very much for bringing that to our audience today. Um, we are going to um, move, or I guess we're moving eastward. We started in Oregon. We spent some time in Iowa. Now we're going to move on to Charlotte. Um, and now I get to introduce uh, Amy Osaker. She is the executive director for Envision Charlotte. Um, Amy is responsible for developing strategic plans for community outreach, fundraising, vendor, and partner relationships. Since she joined Envision Charlotte in July 2013, Amy has used her two decades of expertise in strategic planning, relationship management, marketing, and creative problem solving to help Envision Charlotte become a global model of urban sustainability. Amy's background is a blend of corporate, nonprofit, and entrepreneur expertise. Amy, welcome to our briefing today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. So you want me just, I will launch right in and share my screen. All right, here we go. Move this over here. Um, well, thank you for having me today. I'm, I'm excited to always talk about Charlotte and uh, the program that we have going on with um, not only the city of Charlotte, but many of our corporate partners and our community at large. Um, Envision Charlotte is about 10 years old. We uh, do sustainable projects for the city of Charlotte, and we like to call ourselves a public-private plus partnership. And the plus stands for utilities and universities. We like to bring them into the fold as we're rolling out our projects. Recently, we embarked on the transition to the circular economy. And so what is the circular economy? I'm sure most of you out there know what it is, but I'm just gonna break it down really quickly. It's pretty much zero waste. So right now we're a linear society where we buy something, we use it, we throw it away. A circular society is how I like to refer to it as like a forest. When a forest has a tree, it grows, it dies, it rots, it renutrients the ground, there's zero waste. So how do we become more circular and design out waste, have less going into the stream, and also using those resources at a higher level. So in 2018, we hired Metabolic, a firm out of the EU, to look at Charlotte and analyze our waste streams and help us create a long-term and short-term uh, strategy to transition over to the circular economy. And if you go to our website, which I'll have up at the end, the full report there, and it is actually very fascinating looking at where we are and where we could go as we transition. The first thing they did was study our waste streams. And I find this to be just a very sad slide. If you look at the total waste going into our waste stream and then they segmented it out and then you see how much is going to the landfill, you see how much is being recycled and composting. It's a very depressing slide. But as we like to say, it's also huge opportunities. So we took this slide and they broke it down into areas of focus for us in the short term and then long term. So the first five areas they wanted us to focus on are an innovation center, plastic, organics, textiles, and concrete. Within this study, if you go in, there's all kinds of different business models and opportunities. And if you put them all together, you can see just focusing on basically those four materials, 
we would divert about 150,000 tons of waste. We could create up to 450 jobs. That's about a $6.4 million in potential pro profit and then a reduction of almost 380,000 tons of CO2 per year. So we have started focusing on a lot of these uh, different areas. I'm only gonna talk about one of our programs. We, we have several programs going on, but one that is most relevant to, to today. But I do wanna mention that we are building an innovation center. We call it here in Charlotte, the innovation barn, because it used to be a horse barn. Um, it's kind of fun, interesting story you can go see on our website, but it will be open in June 2021 and it will be a place to engage the community and our corporate partners on how to design out waste, put more, less waste into the system, and then how do we get waste back into production and out of the landfill. So again, that is going to be opened in June of 2021. But the one program I want to focus on today is our Smart Sea Recycling. So as some of the other speakers have talked about today, curbside recycling is challenging. You have over 2000 recycling programs around the United States. You know, if you're in Charlotte, you can recycle, you can put glass into your curbside recycling. If you're in Iredell right up the road, right next to us, you can't recycle glass. So it's very hard to figure out what you're putting in your curbside recycling and what you shouldn't. And in Charlotte, we only have about 11% diversion rate to the landfill, which the national average is 35. And going down as more and more communities stop recycling because as was pointed out earlier, the numbers are upside down. So we decided to do a pilot program with the project goals to reduce contamination, control material destination and increase landfill diversion. One of the areas that we were looking at is that we believe that there should be more individual accountability around recycling. Right now, if you put something in curbside recycling, if you put the wrong materials in it, you could contaminate your entire neighborhood. So there's no way to understand whether you put it in there or your neighbor put it in there. And we did a lot of research over in Europe and other places in the, in the world where they had bins, where you have five different bins in a common area and you still have a ton of contamination because there is no individual accountability. So we launched a program um, back in January where individuals could opt into recycling materials that they use in their household. And we started with two different types of materials, uh, PET, plastic bottles, and aluminum cans. So what you would do as an individual, you could opt in and you could ask for one of those two smart bags. You would receive those bags, they're very clearly marked as you see down here, that you would only recycle aluminum or you would only recycle PET. Those bags also were equipped with smart technology. We like to incorporate smart technology into all of our programs, but these had an RFID, Q, RFID chip in it and a QR code. And the QR code was so that when you got your bag, you went on an app, you registered your bag, so we knew you had the bag, and then you would fill it up with the material. Once it was full, you'd go on the app, you request a pickup. We would dynamically route and bring, come out and pick up that bag we bring it back to the innovation barn, we dump it out. Over time, AI would do this for us, but we would analyze the bag. If you did well and were compliant, we would award you, reward you points, and then you would receive a new bag, rinse, repeat. And so over the three months, we uh, tested this program and we had um, excellent results. So first of all, we looked at the bags, the overall size, we were looking to basically get about two weeks of materials so that we were only driving out to houses every two weeks. And it was actually on average three weeks. Each bag contained about two pounds of materials. The bags were returned full and we had 1% contamination. And what was nice too is when we knew you did something wrong, like send in a green PET bottle, we sent you a letter and then we could see that the next week or the, in two weeks, your contamination rate went down. We did find that the app was a little bit challenging, so we need to simplify that. Um, but the users loved being able to see the points that they got and where those could go to in the end. And we did need to clarify the program. There's some things that we need to look at, like do we want to drop off new bags or would we want to just take the bags and dump the materials on the truck when we come by? And one of the interesting findings was 97% of the people who participated did it because they wanted to know their materials were being recycled. So we were super excited about this program. We just halted it because now we're looking to scale it up. And what we want to do is we want to create a hyper-focused um, local MRF materials recovery facility to process 25,000 households. 
And why we think this is important is right now, so many companies, so many different governments are putting money into MRFs and it's, we're still having a 40% contamination rate. So if we were to actually sort the materials within a household and you only opt into the materials that you use in your household, you don't have to have the resorting, uh, the sorting equipment, which is lowers the cost. We want to continue to look at plastic bottles and aluminum, but we'd love to add additional bags for materials that you can't curbside recycle that MRFs cannot handle, like bubble wrap, air pillows. Could we start collecting those in these bags and sending them back to uh, people who would like to put those back into their materials? We also want to track and monitor uh, a, a variety of things. First of all, equipment costs. You're going to have less equipment costs. Truck efficiency. You're going to have smaller trucks. Uh, they could be electric. That's less road wear and tear. Uh, we are going to be looking at cont contamination rates since we'll be self-sorting, plus we can let people know when they're doing it wrong. And we want additional collections. They just announced that Pringles, for example, is setting up 336 recycling collection places all over Europe to collect those. MRFs are never going to add a place for um, Pringles cans, but we could add a bag. So if you have teenagers that eat lots of Pringles, you could opt in and take one of these bags, fill it up, and we could return that back to Pringles. So that's one of our really exciting programs that we're testing. Like I said, we're hoping to move it up to 25,000 households. That's about 10% of Charlotte's overall curbside recycling. We have a ton of other programs that we're doing around behavioral changes, but this was the most relevant to today's conversation. And I look forward to lots more questions. And if you'd like to see some of the other programs that we have at Envision Charlotte, feel free to check out our website. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much for that um, really cool overview of a very cool program. I, struck with the urge, I kind of want to go to Charlotte and just eat Pringles, um, just because I know that the cans can be responsibly taken care of. Um, go. We go through a lot of Pringles. We don't have a teenager, but we have a seven-year-old who likes his Pringles. And you know what? I like Pringles. Um, they're not a sponsor today. Just, I'm getting hungry. It's, <laughs> it's that time on the East Coast. Uh, thank you, Amy, for that excellent presentation. I'm looking forward to um, learning more about it when we get into the Q&A. Um, and perhaps uh, suggestions for what we could be doing to make more of these kinds of programs possible. Um, our fourth speaker uh, is Bob Powell. Bob is the founder and CEO of Brightmark. Bob has spent the majority of his career uh, working in the renewable energy industry. Most recently, he co-founded a virtual energy team that helped small and large commercial and industrial customers make intelligent energy decisions. Prior to that, uh, he was the president of North America for Sun Edison, president and CEO of Solar Power Partners, and he was also the CFO for Pacific Gas and Electric and a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. Dan, thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, great speakers, uh, tough acts to, uh, to follow up on here. So I'm really excited to be here today for the, uh, for the briefing. And at Brightmark, we represent what we believe to be a uh, one of the solutions. And we fundamentally believe that there are many paths, uh, like the, uh, the old proverb goes, many paths to the top of the mountain. And what we hope here at Brightmark, and our goal is to totally eliminate waste. So with that, what do we do at Brightmark? Well, at Brightmark, we, uh, we are the commercial and the practical um, developer of solutions on the ground that drive environmental solutions to what we think are some of our most profound environmental issues of the day. If I may, there we go. Um, so what are we tackling at Brightmark? We're tackling two of the largest issues that I think we all see out there. One is the plastic issue, the plastic waste issue. Many of you all have seen um, the study that told us that by 2050, if we don't change our course, there will be more plastics in the ocean than fish. And as someone who spends a little bit of time uh, in the ocean, whether it be diving or out at the beach, I see it all the time. And it is a crisis that we must address. 
The other one is part of the climate crisis uh, would be the greenhouse gas emissions that are the result of our human activity and behavior associated with waste. So we tackle both of these. And what we believe is, as I said, there are multiple solution points here in order to get there and solve these problems. I think waste uh, reduction from a consumption perspective is one that's very powerful as well. And then redesigning systems that are more efficient. And then uh, where there is waste that's created, reusing and creating fully circular solutions that eliminate waste are also a key to the solution. So many paths. So what I'd like to talk to you about is the two paths that we're on to eliminate the issues. So the two things are we take, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail on each one of these in a moment here. We take food, animal, organic waste and create negative carbon, renewable natural gas. Negative carbon. So as Dan said, uh, much of my career has been devoted to renewable energy, solar, wind, and even solar and wind, and I'm still super excited about renewable energy resources. In this case, solar and wind are actually positive carbon solutions, albeit low carbon solutions. So how do we create a world that is a zero carbon future? We need to have some minuses, together with the pluses. So renewable natural gas represents, particularly in the animal waste area, among the uh, most negative carbon solutions out there. That's one of the reasons why we're extremely excited about that. So um, we're going to eat food, crops are going to be grown, and there's also going to be, and I happen to reside in California, we have issues with the brush creating fires. There will be organic materials that are produced. And where there are materials that are produced, we need to solve the environmental aspect of those. We also are engaged in plastic renewal technology, which creates fully circular plastic to plastic solutions for plastic products. So plastics um, from a, what do we do after we use the plastics? Um, you may not be familiar with the fact that of all the plastics that we use, only 9% are recycled. 11% are actually used in waste to energy applications. So 80% of these plastics that we use are currently not either recycled or even used in incineration waste to energy. That is a big problem. And that's a problem that we're here to solve. And we have a technology that will deal with all of the non-recycled plastics. One of the reactions to um, the plastic problem is to ban the plastics. And I think being very thoughtful about alternatives to plastics and finding better options is super important. The reality is we can't ban all the plastics. And why is that? Imagine in this uh, year going through the crisis with, uh, with the COVID that we all went through without plastics. Cars are more fuel efficient and safer as a result. There's so many different applications everywhere in our computers, you name it, that are either unfeasible or actually you're not able to replicate them. So we must deal with the plastics after we use them. So I'd like to first focus in on our technology. So our technology, um, as I'll describe in a second, is a patented technology that was invented over 15 years ago to remake plastics and ultimately create usable products and make plastics out of plastics. Um, so the 80% that is not uh, either recycled or used in incineration, we can take all of those plastics in our process. And we can do it on a global, economic, scalable basis. So the first uh, testament to that is our project in Ashley, Indiana, that we started construction on with a $260 million investment uh, two years ago in April of 2019. We actually will complete that facility this year. And at 
on an annual basis, we'll take 100,000 tons of plastics a year out of the environment. So what do we create right now as we uh, are completing and starting up this, uh, this Ashley facility? 18 million gallons of ultra low sulfur diesel and naphtha, which can be used to either blend into gasoline or be used to remake plastics. And we also produce 6 million gallons of wax as well that can be food grade wax, can of wax, et cetera. So um, some of you all may be asking the question, well, you're producing diesel and then something that can go into gasoline. That feels like incineration. That isn't a really good answer for the environment. I would agree with you. And uh, I'll detail more in a moment here, but you should know that our ultimate goal is full circularity to create non-combustible products. So a little bit of a history lesson on uh, really how things have changed environmentally that uh, drove us to having to initially produce diesel and naphtha. Um, a couple of years ago, when we were designing this particular project, there was no demand for recycled feedstocks to make plastics or very little demand. There was not an economic way for us at Brightmark to create fully circular solutions. Well, thanks to uh, government regulation, whether it be extended producer responsibilities or other forms of regulation around waste, uh, even China's um, sort of green fence, keeping us from sending waste products to China, have now made it so that it is now viable for us at Brightmark to use our technology to create fully circular products. So we're on a journey toward full circularity. I'm happy to say that in the future, that's where we end up with this technology. Let me briefly describe what our technology does. It utilizes, and some call it advanced uh, plastic recycling. Um, it utilizes a form of technology known as pyrolysis, and our patents sort of perfected that process. So in uh, our process, what do we do? We take all the 80% that's, uh, that's thrown away and has no use, goes into landfills, oceans, and waterways, and we'll shred those plastics. Oftentimes they come in these big bales that you might have seen, and we turn them into pellets, the pellets you saw on the last page there. So after we pelletize the plastics, we put them into our uh, stainless steel vessels that take the plastics, heat them up, and there's no combustion. So there's no emissions inside those vessels. It's all contained in an oxygen starved environment that ultimately creates a vapor that's then cooled into liquids. And that's where our usable products come from. So the liquids that we use, as I said, can be used to fully reproduce plastics. Our process is 93% efficient and runs on a 724 basis, thus making it economic. So I think it's really important to point out that our goal in creating a world without waste is to close the loop. So the plastic renewal technology that we have will take the post-use plastics, and as I said, we'll break them down into ultimately liquids that will then be uh, utilized to make virgin plastics, but not out of crude oil, not out of natural gas extracted from the ground. So a fully circular loop. So uh, in our process, we significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions as compared to pulling crude oil and natural gas out of the ground. So two good environmental impacts there. Um, and as I said, um, we ultimately can create uh, a majority of the, um, the outputs of our system into new plastics, 70 to 80% total. So our commitment is to make sure that all future facilities that uh, we renew plastics with are fully circular. And uh, what we want to do is create that world without waste in plastic. So let me turn to renewable natural gas. Uh, renewable natural gas, as I said, is uh, negative carbon. And many of our applications are on-farm applications. We have one speaker is from Iowa. Hopefully we get to announce soon uh, some projects in Iowa that are negative carbon that will take animal manures on dairy farms and create renewable natural gas that otherwise would create methane in the environment. 
uh, which is one of the most contaminating greenhouse gases. We have 29 projects across seven states. As you can see, almost 32,000 tons of CO2 that has been pulled out of the air as a result of our projects to date. Um, and you can see here, greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions are reduced by 400% when we replace traditional uh, vehicle fuels. The process is one that can use either food, animal, or other forms of waste. As I said, dairy farms are our most typical application. So what do we do? We take the waste, we put it into a digester, um, which is uh, in some ways almost like uh, a process of uh, fermentation. And after three weeks, the manures, the waste, are converted into clean burning, renewable natural gas that avoids methane emissions. We take that gas, we clean it up, and uh, we inject it into the, uh, into the natural gas pipelines. So you may actually have renewable natural gas in your homes created by projects uh, like these uh, uh, for Brightmark. And I would also say that the other great advantage here is the solid material that comes out of our process is also utilized to put on farms as a more stable fertilizer content, thus reducing nitrogen and phosphorus runoff into waterways that ultimately can make it into places like Lake Erie and the Gulf of Mexico, where we've seen algae blooms. So another powerful environmental uh, benefit. So we're big. Uh, in terms of making our commitments. And this team is really optimistic about the future. And we've got the grit to deliver real solutions uh, environmentally. So our commitment is in the next five years with our plastic renewal technology, we're going to pull 8.4 million metric tons of plastics from landfills and the natural environment and use that plastic to create plastics again, a closed loop solution. We also have committed in the next five years to offset 22 million metric tons of CO2 with our projects, both from the plastic renewal side and then, as I just said, on the renewable natural gas side. So big expectations, big commitments, and this team is here to help solve this problem. So I think the future depends on all of us to uh, solve these problems, and we're super optimistic. And so let's make the future bright. And we at Brightmark, think we have the opportunity to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for that uh, overview of your technology and, um, and your bold plans for the future. Um, really appreciate your presentation. Um, we uh, have one more speaker, but I'm gonna take a quick moment uh, just to remind our audience that we have covered an awful lot of ground. We've been to Oregon, Iowa, Charlotte. Now we've heard from a, um, an innovator uh, from the uh, private sector. Um, all of the presentation materials that you've seen so far uh, will be available online, www.esi.org. So if you'd like to go back and look at any of the programs or the projects or the technologies that we've covered so far, um, you'll be able to do that pretty easily. We'll also have an archive of this webcast uh, so you can watch it as well. Um, and we'll also eventually have uh, written summary notes. Um, so if you need to orient yourself uh, quickly um, to what the content of the uh, briefing was or is, um, you can do that pretty quickly. One quick other reminder, um, one other bit of logistics, if you have questions, um, after we hear from our next panelist, we will have a Q&A. Uh, and if you have questions, you're welcome to send them to us either uh, by email, eesi at eesi.org, or you can follow us on Twitter at eesi uh, online. And now um, it is my pleasure to introduce Sarah Nichols. Sarah is a waste policy expert and leads the Natural Resources Council of Maine's state and local efforts to reduce waste and litter in Maine. She provides the environmental voice for all materials management related policies that come before the state legislature in Maine. Uh, prior to joining the Natural Resources Council of Maine in 2014, Sarah spent several years working to improve recycling programs in rural communities. Sarah, I think you and Bob might be in the running for the nicest backdrop uh, of your Zoom uh, today, but uh, we'll turn it over to you and um, really looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Dan, and good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day um, to join us for this discussion. Um, and thank you to EESI for the invitation. Um, 
So yeah, my name is Sarah Nichols. I am coming to you from uh, NRCM's office in Augusta, Maine. We are uh, an environmental advocacy organization and often confused with being a state agency. So I just like to make that very clear at the outset. Uh, we've been protecting the environment in Maine for uh, about 60 years, and I have the pleasure of um, leading our efforts on all of the waste related policy. I'm our resident trash talker. So I'm gonna spend my short amount of time here today talking to you about a big policy initiative that we're working on here. And um, I'm just in general and uh, just a huge environmental policy advocate. I feel, you know, we all have to share this, uh, share the air, share the water that we drink, and we need policies in place to make sure that we're all protected and can all live on this planet for a long, long time. That's really what sustainability is all about. So you can go ahead and uh, switch my slides. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm just going to, I'm going to touch a lot on a lot of the themes that you've already heard today, but put them in a main context. So right now um, in Maine and everywhere else in the United States, uh, we're making more trash than we recycle. Uh, the amount of trash we're making is going up too. So not only are we trying to uh, recycle more of that pie, but then the pie is growing and we need, really need to focus on shrinking the pie and increasing how much we're recycling. So our state has had a goal to recycle 50% of our waste since 1989, and we have never reached that goal. And in fact, we're going backwards. Our recycling rate is estimated to be about 36%. Um, and I say that because this is the estimated recycling collection rate. That's um, what we guess are we are collecting. But if we had more robust, accurate data, um, and we knew how much was actually recycled, the rate would, would be much, much less. And then meanwhile, our per capita waste disposal rate is increasing. So we're going in opposite of that state goal as well. So it's clear that the business as usual taxpayer funded model of recycling and disposal is not working and uh, it's in need of reform. You can go to the next slide, please. So after waste reduction and reuse, recycling is our best strategy to address the environmental and health problems associated with our um, packaging waste problems. So a big part um, of the equation here is uh, the money that it's costing taxpayers. We really need to work on solutions that bring much needed support to our municipalities who are struggling to pay for and manage our recycling programs. Uh, right now in Maine, it's estimated that our taxpayers pay 16 to 17 and a half million dollars per year to managing manage packaging waste, either through recycling or disposal. We have uh, about 1.3 million people here in Maine. Um, and our DEP, our state agency, reports that it costs an average of 60% uh, more to recycle than to dispose of waste. So you can see you know, that this is not fair and it puts our cities and towns in a difficult situation where they must choose between raising taxes or cutting recycling programs. Uh, we do not believe that the answer lies in throwing even more taxpayer dollars at the problem, but rather in shifting those costs to the producers of waste. So you go to the next slide. So we, uh, this big piece of legislation I mentioned, we're really targeting packaging waste here. Packaging makes up about 40% of the waste stream and much of it isn't designed with recycling in mind. And the type of packaging we have is changing all the time without regard for whether or not there is a recycling bin or a market for that material. And by packaging, I mean um, things like cereal boxes and Amazon packaging and yogurt tubs and takeout containers, juice boxes, flexible packaging, basically all the, the stuff that ends up in your in your household. Uh, I really think there's a surge or tsunami of, in trash and packaging materials, um, and it's just leading to more plastic pollution. It's costing taxpayers a lot of money, uh, unnecessary strain on already struggling municipalities, and it's really harming our environment, and our health. And it really does affect the health of uh, low income and uh, minority populations the most, where this waste is uh, created and where it ends up. So uh, this packaging waste problem is not going to get any better without meaningful changes in policy. So we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk to you about extended producer responsibility. Um, it's a special type of policy that makes the producer of the product or package responsible in some way for the end of life management. Um, but really, it's just the polluter pays principle. So right now, um, producers are not doing enough to help communities make recycling more effective, and part of the reason is because they're not the ones responsible for cleaning up the mess created by their businesses. Uh, they don't currently internalize any of those costs, and rather they externalize those on our municipalities and taxpayers who have little to no control over the, this waste. And uh, my favorite new analogy to use is uh, the, the analogy of my kids cleaning up after themselves at home. I have a four and six year old boys. And, um, you know, when my, especially when my six year old got old enough, I had him start picking up after himself. 
And now that he has to do that, lo and behold, there's less mess in the first place. Um, and plus, it's just more fair that they're the ones who clean up after themselves and not leave it for more. So by applying this polluter pays principle to packaging, uh, Maine can bring relief to our cities and towns and give them the resources they need to improve the long-term effectiveness of recycling. Uh, it also provides the right incentives for producers to reduce their packaging waste and design it to be recycled. Because if they don't, then they're the ones who have to clean it up. I can go to the next slide. So in Maine, we have eight extended producer responsibility laws for other types of problematic waste, including paint and beverage containers, electronic waste, mercury containing products. And there's 33 states with 120 EPR type laws across 14 product categories. We do not yet have a EPR for packaging program in, implemented in the United States right now, but Maine is one of 11 states pursuing it. I uh, have the other ones listed here. Uh, California, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, New Hampshire, and Vermont are also in different stages of considering uh, an EPR policy for packaging. Um, there's also a federal proposal in the Break Free from Packaging uh, from Plastic Pollution Act that has an EPR for packaging in there. Um, but I put this map up to show that while it doesn't exist yet in the United States, uh, big corporations are already paying for recycling programs in over 40 countries, uh, five provinces in Canada. Um, have it too, and some of these programs have been in place for more than 30 years. So this is how we know um, how it works and why it works and that it works. Um, so in these places, recycling rates are, are double to mains um, because producers have a direct economic incentive to produce less wasteful packaging that can easily and profitably be managed by municipal recycling programs. And because there is a sustainable source of funding for recycling, collection, processing, and education. Um, that's having the funding for that is could be the very difference between having a recycling program or not. Um, so that's part big part of the reason why it works. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that these EPR programs have about the same uh, similar per capita cost as our taxpayer funded system, but twice the effectiveness. So you get a lot more bang for your buck with EPR just by shifting those costs from property taxpayers to the producers of waste who can internalize their costs, just like they do all of their other costs of doing business. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So this is very uh, abbreviated for a short presentation, uh, but people like to kind of know how do you make this switch and how do, how do you how do you fund this kind of system. So right now we know that municipalities raise money from property taxes to fund all of the operational costs with recycling and waste disposal programs. Uh, you can. Uh, click here. Thank you. Um, the passage of an EPR bill, though, uh, there's a new stewardship organization that's formed whose primary role it is, is to collect fees from producers based on the weight and type of packaging that they produce, and then reimburse means municipalities for the costs of managing that packaging. And it's material specific. So, um, and they do more than that, too. The stewardship organization would provide assistance to producers to help them reduce their costs, and they would do the same with municipalities. Uh, they can help assess the program, collect all the data, and help us make continual improvements to the system. Uh, the stewardship organization in Maine would be selected by our, our DEP and um, include representation from all stakeholders in the waste system, producers, haulers, recyclers, um, municipalities. And uh, basically, I, I like to think that the stewardship organization connects the waste makers uh, to the waste takers with oversight by the state. Um, and this oversight helps make sure we have transparency and accountability within the system and not necessarily letting the uh, fox watch the penthouse. Uh, so you go to the next slide. So um, I talk about EPR for packaging and my kids pretty much exclusively all day long, but there are sister policies from EPR system that I think are um, extremely important to make the whole system work. So the first is, I, I do believe that we should be banning problematic materials. There's, there are certain materials that are just low-hanging fruit we do not need to be using and making. Um, and for instance, that might be a, a plastic shopping bag. Uh, we have banned those in Maine. And, um, and when, we, when we go to, to, to ban something, there's, there were something like 25 states that did it, or excuse me, 25 towns who did it first. Some of the towns just banned plastic shopping bags, but didn't do anything to discourage a switch to paper. Our state law has a five cent fee on paper bags, so we can really encourage um, a switch over to reuse. I think another interesting um, example of this is another bill we're working on. Um, it was originally proposed to ban all uh, single use plastic water bottles. But the, re we, the real issue is we don't wanna switch from that type of container to another problematic wasteful container. We wanna switch to a more reuse refill system. So that bill is really morphing into uh, trying to get more refill stations set up uh, and, and um, 
eventually make that switch. So we're we're kind of skipping that 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 wasteful step. Um, and next, I, I think it's really important to create incentives uh, for people to do the right thing and put the, put the material. This is more consumer based in the right uh, in the right bin. A really good example would be a beverage container deposit law. Uh, Maine has had one in place for a long, long time uh, since the 70s. There's 10 states that have this type of uh, program. I really consider it the gold star of recycling programs because you get high, high rates of return and you get a really clean recycled commodity coming out of that because it's not mixed with other kinds of wastes. Uh, I'd love to see more states moving in that direction. Or per unit fees, this might be something like uh, your coffee shop would charge five cents for taking a disposable cup or um, or give you money back for bringing your, uh, your reusable cup in, uh, things like that, um, or charging for cutlery uh, instead of that. So um, next, so packaging rules. I think this is a really interesting and um, this is a, a type of policy that you'll see coming, I think, to the United States more and more. These are recycled content standards, for instance. Uh, we're working on a bill here in Maine um, to uh, set a minimum recycled constant standard for plastic beverage containers. I, this is a pretty easy place to start. We need to do more. This is basically a demand side intervention. Recycling doesn't work if there's no market for that material. And we're really trying to create that uh, market demand um, for those. And I really see that as a sister policy to our uh, bottle bill. Okay, a lot more to go there, but uh, that's just a little taste. Um, and you can uh, go to the next slide. So um, this is my last slide, and this really ties to uh, what the federal government could be doing to help at this point. Um, so one of the things I'm really excited about the EPR policy that I described is all the amazing data we will be able to collect. Um, right now, um, you know, main, we, we have pretty poor data. I rely on an outdated 2011 waste characterization study done by um, a university um, to say what's in our waste stream and say with the EPR law, we'll have regular waste recycling litter audits. So we'll actually know what's in our, what's in our waste so we can measure it. Um, and, you know, like I said, we don't know how much is actually recycled. We know what's collected. So we need to do better at that. So, but in Maine and uh, other states, we like to compare our progress with the nation as a whole. And let's just say the national numbers leave a little something to be desired. Um, not only that, but states all calculate things a little bit differently. And depending on the data, you can get skewed or inflated results, and that's not helpful. Uh, these numbers are used for all kinds of things like national reports and climate benefits of so recycling and jobs. It's just really important data to have right. And right now, uh, the EPA is actually in the process of soliciting feedback on how they would calculate the nation's recycling rate. Uh, NRCM has signed on to a letter by the Container Recycling Institute, along with Conservation Law Foundation, uh, the Reloop platform, uh, with some observations and suggestions. And one of the biggest issues uh, that we see is that the EPA has uh, consistently and significantly undercounted our waste. So the amount generated or the denominator, denominator by perhaps as 30 to 45% is missing from the equation. And that can really inflate our recycling rate, which leads to all kinds of problems. Um, and it doesn't add the urgency that we really need that David touched on at the beginning. If we think we're doing a, you know, a good job at recycling, it, it's, uh, it's, that's not necessarily the case. And we need to focus more on uh, waste reduction and reuse and refill opportunities. And making, if people think that they're, if everything that they're putting in their bin is actually getting recycled and it's doing good, it's not gonna help us get to the, the place that we really need to be. And we also need to make sure that we count the right things as recycling and make it a little bit more standardized. One of the most important things I think we need to be doing is making sure that any um, incineration or waste uh, waste to fuel isn't counted as recycling, but as something else. Uh, you're not recycling anything when you're doing that. You're more It's more destroying and it's not doing anything to take away the pressure of putting more waste into the system if we have businesses who rely on feeding more waste. It's more like uh, a hungry trash monster. So we should just call it like it is and not make sure not to call that recycling. Okay, and I think um, that is about all I have. And there's my contact information and I'm very uh, excited to, for the discussion and answer questions. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah. Um, that was a very good trash talk. Um, that was good. The, these briefings, there's a point when I'm like, kind of regretful how few puns I work in. Um, and so I really appreciate that you um, talked about talking trash and being a trash talker. That, that made it, you couldn't see me because my camera was off, but that got a big grin. So thank you for that. 
Um, I'm going to invite our panelists to um, join us for the discussion. Um, and uh, while I do that, uh, or before I do that, um, there is still, we have about 20-ish minutes, maybe a little less. Um, if you still have a question, or if you have a question, there's still a way to submit it. Follow us on Twitter at ESI Online. Send us an email, ESI at ESI.org. Um, Sarah, I'm going to use your presentation as, um, as a bit of inspiration for our first question. Um, you know, ESI, this is part of our policymaker education, uh, and we're primarily focused on federal policymakers, so Congress and the administration primarily. Um, I'm going to, um, we'll start back where we began with David, and then we'll go through the panel if you have any comments. Um, but I'd like to invite comments, or I'd like to invite answers or perspectives on what federal policymakers could be doing, if there are things the federal government, say, could be doing to promote these types of programs, to promote these types of innovations, if there are things the federal government could do that would be a bad idea, that would actually hinder the success of some of these programs um, or innovation, um, or you know, at least help us understand maybe where the right balance is between a federal support role for this and states and local governments doing, uh, uh, doing their best and, and doing what they can do better. So David, I'll begin with you and then we'll, we'll go to Jen and then to Amy and then to Bob and then to Sarah. All right, thanks so much, Dan. I'd like to talk for just a minute about the disconnect between costs to society and the prices that are paid for materials. Um, using fewer materials, waste prevention, reuse, recycling in all of its forms, typically reduces environmental impacts. And those impacts have real benefits to our, real impacts to our society. Disease, disability, death, caused by pollution, the impacts of climate change, rack up costs in the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars a year. And waste prevention and recycling can reduce those costs, but we are under investing in them because the price signals that industry and government are responding to are not accounting for those impacts. So what could the federal government do? First of all, um, address these virgin material subsidies. But let me give you one example. Cheap shale gas, you know, is great for certain sectors of the economy. It is, it creates incredibly fierce headwinds for both plastic and paper recycling because the primary economic value of that recycling is in the displacement of um, fossil fuels, primarily natural gas. When natural gas is cheap, recycling is worthless. So the fact that we have such uh, incredibly inexpensive and subsidized virgin resources is a significant challenge. And on the flip side, the fact that we don't account for the cost of pollution. So putting a price on carbon, putting a price on human health pollutants, all of these things would make materials pay and the users of those materials pay their real cost to society. And with that, um, more recycling and prevention could happen. So the federal government could play a, a critical role there in getting the economics right. Thanks. Um, Jen, do you have comments to share? Oh, I'm having a hard time hearing you. And I wonder if... Mm -mm. I can see you speaking, but I can't hear it. Um, maybe what we'll do is we'll move to Amy and give you a moment to figure it out, and then we'll come back to you at the end. So Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Um, what could the federal government, what could federal policymakers be thinking about to either, uh, you know, help these programs or stay out of the way of successful programs or be on the watch for things that could hinder progress? Thanks for the question. For us, it's, it's a little challenging because in Charlotte, we tend not to do a lot of policy around these type of issues, just given the nature of our state. Um, however, I do think the federal government can have a huge role in convening. You know, when you have over 2000 recycling programs across the United States, they're all different. And they're so, you know, I learned so much just on this call alone, needless to say, what else, what other innovations are going on around the United States. I think the federal government has a real opportunity to do more convening, bringing out more best practices and kind of vetting some of those opportunities. In addition, I think some standardizations around measurement. I think all of us would like to see a little bit more, uh, you know, ways to measure truly what's um, going to landfill, what's being recycled so that there's more standards across uh, the 
the entire United States. Um, so those are probably my two areas. Again, we stay, we tend to stay out of policy. So it's more of the, let's see how we can do this with the carrot versus the stick. I'm glad you said convening because that I think is an underappreciated role of the federal government in a lot of these challenges. Um, Bob? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting question. And, and by the way, David, what you said about measuring uh, the true cost of environmental aspects uh, is really, really important. And, uh, you know, it's my view that a lot of the problems we have right now environmentally are because we have a measurement issue. We don't know how to measure it and we don't know how to price it. So, um, so further thoughts on this are, um, and, and I previously have spent a lot of time working in renewables. So I've seen uh, what the federal government can do to help us and incent the right behaviors. So one of the things I have in my mind is that um, the federal government should target the outcomes. You know, the, uh, what is the waste problem and what are we trying to solve? And uh, perhaps allow for innovation in getting there. And I say that because what I've seen, uh, you know, both in good and bad is the good side is really trying to regulate outcomes. The bad side is trying to pick winners and losers from a technology standpoint. Um, and uh, one example would be what I talked about before, which is, gosh, Bob, this first plant in Indiana, you're creating transportation tools. Well, um, as you then saw, ultimately, what I will do, because now I have people who actually will buy it and pay me for it, is create a fully circular solution. If I had been cut off in the early stages from doing that, I might not ever get here, and then we're left with uh, you know, a massive plastic waste problem that we can't ban our way out of. We just can't. There's too many good uses immediately now. So what I would say um, that that is, um, one thing to consider. And as I saw in renewables, there are solutions that drive these outcomes that we want. When there are demonstrated solutions to the problems, that's where, and in solar and wind, we have the investment tax credit, the production tax credit. When you verify that you're solving the problem, you can incent uh, with those types of programs. So a little history lesson on solar, uh, in 2008, when I started working exclusively in renewable energy on solar, the cost of a solar panel was over 10 times what it is now. In that time, we were not competitive on par with coal-fired generation, other forms of generation with much dirtier outcomes. Because of the incentives that were solving the problem, we are now able, both with solar and wind, to produce on margin competitive and sometimes better pricing. So incent what drives the outcome, the technology that gets there is huge. And I would also say, allow the states to also innovate uh, around the outcomes. The LCFS program for negative carbon renewable natural gas in the state of California is a fantastic program. So allow the states to innovate as well. So there's a couple of thoughts. Jen, welcome back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm happy to go back to you if you have thoughts about sort of what policymakers could be thinking about, um, and then we'll go to Sarah. Yeah, for, for us, a little, for me, it really strikes to, I would like to see a little more consistency in the standards across the states, and some of that has to do with the measurements too. Um, you know, they, the, the proposal about a national recycling standard, we responded to um, with a further, larger group through a SWAMO. But like the state of Iowa doesn't actually, we don't track recyclables, yet we do give the, the federal government numbers every year, um, but we have to extrapolate those through our, our waste characterization studies and the different programs. So to have some expectations about what they're looking for and how to get that consistent across all of the states would be helpful. I think that um, establishing a federal um, EPR would be great. I mean, we have a deposit, a bottle deposit system here in Iowa, but and it works, but we've seen um, its success diminish over the years. 
if we had a federal deposit system, it might bolster that program for us. Um, but I think Sarah made the point, like if you have these programs in place, we often are complimented in Iowa about our recyclables. They're clean, they're, we, have, we have contamination, I'm not gonna deny it, but we have less contamination than some other states because of the fact that we've had a bottle deposit system in place for 30 plus years. So it's become, it's kind of become nor the norm for a lot of people. And for the state of Iowa, we have some fairly robust grant programs to fund um, innovation and in managing waste, but we just don't have the funds as, as robust as we used to. And so it'd be great if there were opportunities from the feds to almost be to match. At one point I was in the energy side of things and there's a state energy program that's a federal De Department of Energy grant program. It'd be nice to have that from the EPA, less so about all everything always being competitive grants and maybe funding states and state agencies to do some of these more innovative, um, specifically related to infrastructure development. Like in our state, we need an, you know expanded anaerobic digestion, and I'm delighted to hear that Brightmark is is coming to Iowa and doing that. So those would be my thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, we actually covered. Uh, state energy program at a briefing a few, I'm going to say a few weeks ago, because I don't really have a concept of how time works anymore, but it was our energy efficiency means brief, uh, means business briefing. And we had someone from the state of Connecticut talking about state energy program. It's a, it's a great program. I just wanted to mention that. And Sarah, um, eager to hear from you. Um, uh, additional sure. thoughts. Um, sure. I'll just, uh, I'll try to be brief. I know we just have a few minutes left and we can get to another question or maybe my comments can lead into another question. Uh, and I, I pretty much already covered that I, we need better data. I would love for the EPA to do a, a really good bang up job and how they're gonna start calculating a recycling rate and not do that in a way that hinders progress. <laughs> um, so more on that, but uh, I, I'm, I'm growing increasingly concerned with the environmental justice as, aspect of managing waste and states one by one can pass more protective laws. New Jersey just passed a pretty, uh, pretty progressive um, environmental justice law that takes consideration the people living next to polluting facilities uh, or waste, you know, waste facilities or production facilities. But the more states that do that, great. But then those facilities are just going to move to other states and still going to be impacting people in other states. Or waste is going to be uh, shipped to another country where they don't have the environmental protections that we do. And we would do a better job at managing those here. So I could see the the, the federal government playing a better role in um, in making it so that. The, the waste and the, the production facilities don't follow the path of least resistance um, and focus more on um, the health related impacts of this whole materials management system. Thanks. Um, and we are kind of getting close, um, but I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity if they would like um, to comment on sort of the environmental justice element that you mentioned, Sarah. Um, I think it's fair to say that our waste generation and disposal habits have a disproportionately negative impact on um, communities of color and low income communities. Um, I'll, I'll open this up to anyone on the panel who would like to chime in, but um, I'd like to hear other thoughts about what we could be doing better in waste management to um, address and advance environmental justice goals. Hey, uh, Dan, I'll, I'll jump in here. So the legislation that I mentioned we're working on in Oregon addresses this across the entire um, life cycle of the recycling system. We have a collection program um, in Oregon that provides inconsistent service, generally lower income, rural residents and people of color are less likely to have access to recycling opportunities. Then when the recyclables are collected, mixed and they're sent to these processing facilities, the working conditions in those facilities are very dangerous and dirty. Um, and, and in some cases they're not even paying a living wage. Um, so there are local, uh, social equity issues there. Um, there are there are the impacts of our exported recyclables uh, improperly sorted and sent to countries that lack adequate disposal infrastructure or regulation. And I showed some pictures of that. And finally, there's really an equity issue in terms of who pays for and who benefits from our recycling system. The benefits of our recycling system are in providing feedstock to industries and reducing pollution impacts wherever those facilities are located most of that is not in Oregon. So our current system has people in Oregon as ratepayers paying to reduce pollution and human health impacts in other states and nations, which once you look at it, 
really strikes us as rather odd. So our, our legislative approach addresses all those issues. I don't have time to go into all the details, but if anyone wants to reach out, um, we're happy to talk more. Thanks for that. Um, other perspectives from around the panel on um, either Sarah's earlier point, David's points, or um, other perspectives? I mean, I, I'll give a couple. Um, and uh, so one of our core values is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that has a, a lot of different, uh, there are a lot of different ways that we can live our values, so a value associated with that. Um, I think one, David, you mentioned, which is living wages. We're committed in our projects and we do employ people. Um, on our on our projects on the ground where we're solving problems is we're absolutely committed to pay not just a living wage but a thriving wage and many of the folks we employ are not white collar engineer types of folks yes we do employ those as well but we employ people maintenance you name it and there's all there's a value in each and every one of us and we want to celebrate that so that's that's one way that we believe we can do it another way is actually looking at things like where we site our projects um, i won't give specifics but i will tell you that there are siting decisions we make about the communities that we go into they're in and around uh you know more disadvantaged lower economic communities um, i will refuse to make bad decisions around that that would negatively impact so and it isn't you know so we're solving a problem but um property values all those kinds of things trucks going in and out um i think we need to be more equitable about how we do that and thoughtful and considerate and then the third and final thing for me is part of it applies here in the states and part of it applies uh, globally as well. Some of the solutions in some communities um, that have a higher cost may not work in other areas. The reality is, um, you know, there are communities in the states that are of lower means and our ability to impose the same solution could actually lower the standard of living of communities uh, globally. So when we think about imposing solutions, we need to solve the uh, the standard of living equation as well. And so that's something we think about a lot too. So those are the three aspects that I thought made sense from our perspective. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I think we are just about out of time. Um, this was awesome. Thank you very much, David, Jen, Amy, Bob, and Sarah for five really, really interesting and excellent presentations. I learned a ton. Um, and I kind of, <laughs> I had a chance to know what we were going to talk about beforehand, and I still learned so much about these really cool programs um, that are making a difference, and um, hopefully for our audience, um, helping inspire some thoughts about what we could be doing better, um, whether it's policy, whether it's environmental justice, or, or other things. And I know since we've um, been thinking a little bit more about these issues at EESI, I know um, as a consumer, um, I've been thinking a little bit more about sort of my own decisions and um just just really really kills me to have to throw plastic away uh it just uh it really bugs me um and um we're um, actually just started composting and things like that so it's um not possible to fix any of these problems um as an individual but um i think the the leadership um that you all are um showing and the um and the way that you're mobilizing your communities to work uh, as one for these problems is, uh, is a great message and um, also generating results, which is especially important given the urgency of the moment when it comes to climate solutions. So thank you all so much. Um, we will go ahead and wrap. I will ask my colleague, uh, Dan O'Brien to share his screen. Um, thank you very much, uh, members of our audience. If you have a moment, um, we would really appreciate it if you would take our survey it helps us a great deal understand um, the relevance of our topics. If you had any technical issues, we want to hear about it all. And if you submit a response, I can guarantee that we'll read it. Uh, we absolutely take your feedback very, very seriously. We're always looking to improve. Um, let me also thank my colleagues at EESI for making today's briefing possible. I'll start by the person uh, who is um, pretty much our briefings go to person, Dan O'Brien. 
This is our third briefing in three business days. So thank you very much, Dan O'Brien, the other Dan. I'm the other Dan, technically, because Dan O's been here more than me. Um, thank you for everything you've done over the last weeks to um, pull off this really great run of briefings. Thanks also to Sydney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Totteroff, Anna McGinn, and Omri Laporte for um, everything that you've done uh, as well. Also, um, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank uh, Savannah Bertrand. Savannah uh, joined the ESI yesterday as our new policy associate. Um, she was a former intern and she's back um, and I'm looking forward to working with her. So thanks very much. She's been on the ground with us for a day and a half and uh, I just wanted to thank her for her contribution so far. And of course we have five fabulous interns, Celine, Hamza, Jocelyn, Kimmy, and Rachel. Uh, they're helping us with questions. They're helping us with tweeting. They're helping us with written summaries, all of that. So thanks for all of your good work. Um, we uh, have uh, our next briefing on the calendar is next Friday, April 30th, 2 p.m. It's the fourth installment of our Congressional Climate Camp series. We will be looking at adaptation and mitigation double whammies, things we can do in the near term, in many cases with bipartisan support to um, uh, advance mitigation and uh, adaptation goals for climate. So I urge everyone to tune in um, to that. And lastly, if you missed anything, if you want to go back and look at slides, if you want to rewatch any of the webcast, uh, if you want to um, contact any of our speakers um, using the um, uh, contact information they included in their slides, everything is available online at www.esi.org. And while you're there, I hope you take a moment to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It's really the best way to keep up with all we're doing. With that, I wish everyone a very happy rest of your Tuesday. Thanks again to our panelists, and we will see you next time. Thanks.